Hello, my name is Scott Summerfield and I'd like to welcome you to the panel discussion tonight on new technologies implemented into bioanalytical workflows. So we're here at RIB um, in Philadelphia um, and we have three topics to cover, but first let's introduce you to the panel members. Hello, I'm Roger Hayes, I'm from MPI Research, a Charles River company. Hi, my name is Maina Liang. I'm a director at the Clinical Pharmacology and DMPK at uh, Metamune. Hello, my name is Afshin Safavi. I'm the co-founder and the chief scientific officer at Bioagilytics Labs. Hello, I'm Dominic Marino. I'm the senior scientific advisor for KCAS. Hello, I'm, I'm Lina Law, a senior scientist in Pfizer. And my name is Ian Moore. I'm a technical product manager for the nominal mass platforms at SciX. Thank you, everybody. Um, we represent quite a broad distribution of people that work in the bioanalytical universe, from CROs to um, pharma to vendors. And um, just interested in the first question, really, what do you think the drivers are currently for new technologies coming into bioanalysis? Just open that to the floor. Yeah, so I wouldn't mind starting. So the you know, the primary driver obviously being in a CRO is when a sponsor comes to you and says, hey, do you have this piece of technology we'd like to transfer an assay to you? So it's really the partnership with a, uh, with a potential sponsor and they're looking for um, certain technology platforms that we may or may not have. You know, I can build on one, what Roger said. You know, for us, um, when we look at uh, technology, we're looking to solve a problem. So either there's a gap in, uh, in the in the, in the analysis that is needed, and, and that's where you know, it will be a driver for the, for the new technology, or there is an improvement that is needed for current technology, and therefore you know, we are looking for improved and new technology. So, um, and that, that, that gap can be driven either by the pharma to us from the client perspective, or it can, be, um, it can come to us because um, we just know there is a request out there there is a problem there and, and we need to find a solution for it through the new technology. Yeah, from the farmer side, I can um, say that what we're looking for is the, um, the, the gap for the, to support uh, the programs, either the new modalities or the new challenges. And from that, then we're looking for technolo new technologies to develop a novel uh, method or um, uh, normal ways, normal ways to characterize the target. Um, and so that's what we're looking for. Yeah, I agree with Amanda. Um, with the current drug development, development process, the program's getting more and more complicated. We are constantly looking for the new technology to uh, resolve the new um, uh, problems like challenges. Uh, for example, like the simple uh, PK analysis right now, they, they from the pre, uh, previous the single dose become the cassette dose, and they may have the, the parent to metabolize the convert to each other. So uh, the, all the problem get more and more uh, complicated. So this kind of the major driver to, for us to seeking new technologies. And I'll build on the CRO side, as Ashwin mentioned. You know, you do solve a problem, but for us, it's, and you mentioned the emerging technologies aspect of things. That's definitely where we're seeing the need for more advancement in technology to meet some of the needs, and especially what's the PK profile for some of the gene therapies or even CAR T cells. That becomes a major issue with how you try to support them. Basically, it's more of a pharmacodynamic or a functional assay. And those are where we see a lot of advancements in technologies that we want to go after. And maybe I'll just add, as a vendor, it's uh, important to us to understand uh, what problems are trying to be solved in industry and make sure we stay closely aligned uh, with our customers to understand those needs and deliver the right technology. And that right technology might not always be about uh, sensitivity. It could be about usability, ease of learning, and, um, and ease of uh, maintenance. Sorry, maybe I can build on that too because one other aspect that's important is um, not just the ease of use, it's the cost, right? That becomes uh, challenging and everybody wants greater sensitivity, but th that might not always be what's needed because some of the throughput on those instruments is really low. And so that, even though they're solving some of the problems with the sensitivity that's out there, 
Um, there is a, how are you going to run a thousand samples? You're going to need six or eight of these instruments and you're going to need some highly trained technicians. So that becomes a little bit of a challenge when evaluating these things. Right. And sometimes the innovation is really about efficiency. So again, being in a CRO, it is about uh, being more and more efficient. Mm -hmm. And so the te a, a new technology could be as simple as um, a simple bit of automation, right? And so going from some of the, the small standalone um, robot that does one thing but really well, and then you go up all the way to say some of the, um, uh, the platforms like Gyros where you're looking at full automation, but again, it's the efficiency, um, reducing the, uh, the amount of time that a, you know, an analyst might need to spend in the lab and to get the throughput through, which again is what drives the, uh, the need for a CRO. You know, I would, I, would, um, I would also add, you know, I think it depends on, on what you're trying to solve, right? Uh, you guys mentioned sensitivity, throughput, cost, um, and, and, and there's always a buzzword for, for that year, right? There was a time of a buzzword for multiplexing for a few mm -hmm. years. Then, then there was a, there was a you know, the, right now the buzzword is sensitivity. Everybody wants to say, you know, and, 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 and the question that I always, at least I propose to my clients is that, is that what is it that you want to use the data for? What is it that is the absolutely required versus what is, what is nice to have? And then based on that, really decide if an existing technology will solve the problem or is it that you really got to go outside the box and look at for a new technology that may be some still not proven to the regulatory agency. So, so to, to me, again, the, 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 the short of it is, you know, um, look at what is the need, how are you going to fill in that gap, what technology do you have that fill in that gap, and if you don't have it, then we look for outside technologies. So it's almost like you're reverse engineering. That's yeah. the approach we sort of take. Start yeah. with what do you need yeah. and how are we going to work backwards to find out how to solve that for you. Exactly. Because you're right, a lot of people when they see how some of these sensitive platforms that we offer, they see the price tag, they're like suddenly they don't need it, right? That yeah. can happen. Exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, so some forward looking or forward planning is also, uh, I think it's very important because right now you have maybe some unmet need for to support your pipeline right now. Mm -hmm. However, there is a constant evolving of uh, different type of drugs yeah. um, and there is a new therapies coming online and then there's some requirement for bioanalysis and we can look into that in the future and then plan ahead and looking for technology to implement. So, so we've heard CAR T, gene therapy, mm -hmm. they're obviously yeah. quite new. Mm -hmm. um, so are there any other areas where the pipeline seems novel where pharma companies or CROs are seeing the need for technologies that maybe aren't triple quads or things well, that we're so aware and that's, of? And that's the concept around the gene therapy. You've got to look at biodistribution. So it may not necessarily be, um, you can do an oligo by LCMS, but you can certainly do it when you start talking about some of the larger you know, modified RNAs that we heard about this morning. Um, those are the ones where you might need, you know, hybridization techniques or ultimate sensitivity because you're really looking at tissue and, and tiny amounts of tissue from a human biopsy. Any other thoughts? On CAR T cell specific or gene <laughs> therapies? We're here to talk so, about um, you know, there's a lot of challenges. I mean, we're getting hit with uh, all sorts of questions where, um, the biotech or farmers are sort of really looking for us to say, how are you going to help us support right. your toxicology? So um, there's, um, there's actually CAR macrophages. I don't know if that's sort of a new thing. And um, one client is inquiring about that, and they've said, how would you, um, the FDA has asked us to look at the effects of um, cell lines. So mm -hmm. they can generate their, um, just in this case, CAR macrophage, and it kills a particular cell type. And then they say, well, what's the, okay, that's great, but if I took human cell lines, and now they have 22 human cell lines they want to screen. So how would you go about doing, I mean, just uh, think about what I said. So it's a flow those. method. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you can yeah. multiplex it, but you got to, <laughs> and then they don't even have characterization of the receptor of interest on those cell lines. Mm -hmm. So it starts, it's a real, it's a very iterative process. Um, it's something, I, I, don't, I don't pretend to have all the answers to it, but we're certainly trying to help as much as we can. And you know, having the fortune of working for a biotech, a couple of biotech companies in the '90s doing ex vivo autologous therapies, mm -hmm. those—that's really the same challenge that's happening. With you know, you got to take it out of the person. You've got to worry about sterility. You got to worry about testing. It's not a pharmacokinetic test. You're not going to look at those cells as being your PK. You've got to look at how am I augmenting the immune system and then the safety profile, and that becomes mm -hmm. a very broad 
thing. And, and I'll add there, we're actually working with some other companies that are doing stem cell therapies. Mm -hmm. And so they're doing stem cell therapies for enzyme replacements. And so they're producing an endogenous protein and now the immunogenicity pro risk goes very high. Right. Even though, you know, that, that it's, um, it becomes quite complex and we're happy that we can continue to try and support this. And to just build on what, what was uh, said, what we're seeing is that the platforms that were traditionally built for support of research and discovery projects mm -hmm. are being pushed to be used mm -hmm. at the latter stages of drug development. And what that means here is that some of the vendors, they're sort of thinking ahead of time and, and they're proactive and they're actually working to get those platforms um, in such a way that can be you know, more robust and also be used in the regulated environment, <coughs> both from an instrumentation platform as well as from a software perspective. Um, and then there are some that the challenge is, at least for us as a CRO, I'm sure it also falls a challenge on the, on the pharma, that taking this instrument, this platform, this technology goes for discovery use and doing some creative, you know, software validation <laughs> or other <coughs> things that one needs, adding automation to them, doing something to them to make them uh, more uh, friendly and actually being, you know, making them useful for latter stage of the drug development process. And think about a CRO and where a you know, resource partner comes along, it's usually at the time of the regulated analysis. So it is the farmer, you, you, you're sort of in that discovery space, utilizing new technologies, and there you go, and well, okay, um, we're probably not set up to do the, the regulated work, we would prefer a partner, and now we have to actually step up our game, certainly in the CRO space, to be able to introduce that new technology, get it validated, make sure we know how to operate it, get it efficient, uh, and then even be able to do it in a regulated space, um, all in a very short time frame. So uh, welcome to the CRO world, but uh, <laughs> it is one of those nice drivers, if you're talking about the technology, is being able to, to provide um, for a sponsor, as obviously they're trying to do the drug development, um, we're looking at our ability to support that, and so the efficiencies in that aspect to it, but then as a new technology comes along, are we even prepared or able to um, be able to support that? That's an interesting point, actually, because um, but traditionally, Pharma has moved a lot of work out to CROs, the later phase, the regulated right. work. Right. And it sounds like, even though discovery technology is coming through, yep. that expectation for maybe the CRO sets to validate. You better even is, have it. You better have yeah, it already. It's yeah. still the same as yeah. it was for the other platforms. That's right. Good statement was made earlier on by, by our colleagues here from Pharma that you know you, you, you think ahead of time, mm. to plan ahead of time. And and I do again think there are companies that pharma biotech that early on, even during the discovery stage, they're thinking, I'm going to take this assay, this test. Right later on if it works out to the clinic, to the to support of the, you know, again, animal studies and so on. So, so even at that point, they are moving, you know, um, again, they're thinking about the, is this platform going to be friendly for latter uses, right. right? And there are some that they're not, you know, planning ahead and, and, and it can cause some, uh, some serious headaches both for the CRO as well as for, um, for, the, for the pharma. So we've covered some quite unique areas where we're moving towards. What about PK? You know, mm. what are we seeing in terms of PK emerging sort of platforms or whatever that, that are needing to meet demand? Well, a lot of yeah. it, I mean, it oh, I'm sorry. When it comes down to sensitivity, you're always looking for better sensitivity because they don't have to work so hard. Certainly on the small molecule, the LCMS, we're going to keep coming to vendors and saying, hey, we like a little, we need another log unit in sensitivity because then I just have to take a very small sample. Right, and then I can dilute it and I have to worry about all that nonsense matrix effects and things like that. So they will always ask, right, and that's what drives it. Um, on the LBA side, it's the smaller samples, uh, but then you've got to do multiple, uh, multiple assays. It's not just good enough to do the PK for the target, you've got to do the PK for the biomarker, and there's probably half a dozen of those you want to monitor, and so the sample volume becomes very critical. So again, sensitivity drives our ability to do these analyses with smaller and smaller volumes. Yeah, I would like to add on that. Previously, we normally see the PK studies just for to do the uh, exposure time course. Right now, they try to build the biomarker assay with the PK analysis t together at a very early discovery age to try to build the, the PBPK model. Mm -hmm. So they try to um, 
put the biomarker assay and the PK assay together because the sample value is so mm -hmm. limited, especially on the new modality or the new area, for example, ADC projects or the oncologies. <laughs> so we do have very limited the samples to use. Mm -hmm. They try to use like the one stone two, two birds at the s for to resolve this kind of complicated pro uh, problems. As a, as a technology provider, I'll go back to it's important for us to be collaborative and understand the customer problem. When you mentioned sensitivity, mm. you know, we're talking signal to noise, yep. and you can improve that by being more selective, uh, for instance, right? So maybe a triple quad technology won't get you there, but maybe something like an accurate mass sure. can reduce noise and get you that gain in signal right. to noise, or even an orthogonal technique like uh, ion mobility uh, sure. could deliver right. uh, what is needed. But as we start to increase the complexity of the instrumentation, so iron mobility is an example, at a CRO you've also got to have people to run it. And so the investment in training and all the rest of it becomes a bit of an issue. Um, so we can look at triple TOFs and things like that as being wonderful tools with great sensitivity. Well, now we've got to find somebody to run it. What a great question. <laughs> Point into the seg segue into the second question. So this one's really about the barriers to those new technologies because we've heard the need is there, yep. the need's there from the new modalities. Right. Um, so maybe training is a, right. as a potential barrier, particularly with new technologies. So please yep. expand on that. Yeah, and so just hear others. You know, looking at the, you know, the, uh, the CRO and where you're trying to recruit, um, oftentimes you're not going to pharma which have probably had the experienced people and then to be able to steal them and bring them into uh, the CRO space. Usually it's the opposite way. So we'll train them up and then you'll steal them. Um, and so then to be able to ho hang on to people and <laughs> steal, <laughs> borrow, utilize, you know, everybody who has their we're career. career. <laughs> exactly, we're all good. And, you know, it comes down to the, our ability to recruit and retain. And I know Ashton's got some wonderful um, recru recruiting and retention strategies that, uh, you know, you can put the investment in time, uh, but we're also dealing with a, a generation that likes to move and be forward mobile. So to train somebody how to use a triple quad or is one thing, and that's usually fairly straightforward. So when we talk about, you know, adding iron mobility, it's like, well, what is iron mobility? Um, how do I set up the instrument to get the best out of it? That usually requires a little bit more training and a little bit more investment in that training. And will you then be able to hang on to that individual sufficient to get that return and investment on the training uh, because, well, maybe they want my job in another month, you know, so you've got to deal with that. I, th I think one thing that really will help, it will be uh, for the companies that uh, produce these new technologies, if they can help the farmers or sure. uh, the other companies to uh, generate data, like proof of concept data, because usually if the farmers or biotech, if they are interested in a certain mm. technology, they have a unmet a need for or there's a gap in what they need to do and so you need to generate the proof of concept data to demonstrate and justify why you want to uh, make an investment and usually those right. are not cheap so right. you really have to have some data generated before you even have the instrument hmm. um, so you know for, for us you know I would say in terms of again the barriers um, for us, for us, the biggest factor, you know, we talk, uh, there's a lot of talk about the cost of the instrument. The reality for a, an, uh, you know, for a CRO world is that that's only a small part of it. The, the, the time and the cost involved in implementing the instrument, meaning bring it on site, mm -hmm. the training that was right. mentioned, incorporating that with your limb system, doing the software validation, uh, putting all the SOPs and the maintenance that are needed, for keeping up with that platform and making sure everything's in a working order, it adds up. So for us, at least at Biogeolytics, when we look at the cost of the instrument, that's just a small portion of it. Yeah. Uh, the rest of it can be extremely challenging. I can tell you one of the most challenging thing we face is with some of these really good, interesting, useful platform is the software validation part. Yeah. This instrument, we can get it in and set it up maybe within a month but it might take you know, six months plus to go through the, through the software validation right. and the incorporation into the, into the, into the, rest, of the rest of the system. So Right, now the integrity of the data is obviously paramount and that's yeah. trying to get that software validation squared away. That, 
I couldn't agree more. I, I, not only is the, the investment in the instrument is one thing, but there is so much more behind trying to get, a lot of the vendors are not ready for prime time. And we've experienced that with two in particular. One is the Genlite Maverick. That was an instrument that came on and it has now gone defunct. Mm -hmm. And the other is the Quinteric system, sure. the Samoa. That We've had it for over three years. It took a year to help them understand how to get CFR 21 compliant. Wow. And I think that's where the relationship has to be built. It's the vendor either coming to the farmer and the CRO and really starting to set the expectation the right way. Because mm -hmm. they have they have their way of doing the data manipulation, but it's not universal. Right. And that's problematic. Um, and then as for the talent, that's always a challenge. That That's something that uh, we think of ourselves as like a division one football team. Yeah. And we go out and actively recruit all of our HR people, our recruiters, and we don't really have a whole lot of problems over the last year getting mm -hmm. people. You just got to find the right people. Um, and one of the things that we really like is we have a few scientists that are almost, um, they're like engineers. And so that is very powerful to have. If they can take apart a flow cytometer, they're pretty good about some of these other instrumentations. We also have 16 LCMS instruments and that team can help us. So it's a nice mix um, and that, that really does help. And then the vendor usually certifies you. Uh, you're, you know, some, even Mesoscale and those type systems, they come out and do training and they'll put you on the website to help you sort of you know, brand yourself as being someone who can do that technology. Yeah, from a farmer standpoint, I think Pfizer, as a big farmer, really um, do a very good job on the trainings. The employee get properly the trainings, especially when we have the new instrument. Um, also, we have very good partnership with the vendors. For example, Science, they brought in the new instrument. Uh, we work together to uh, to improve the, like the opto uh, micro system. Mm -hmm. They just finished the, the test in our lab. And also, they come back to our lab to do the constantly training, visit our problems, try to solve I, when we have a problem with the project that they come back to us. So we really appreciate that the collaboration and the partnership with vendors. Yeah, I think it's uh, you know important for any vendor to be collaborative with their customers, right? To make sure that the product is is usable, <laughs> right? And, and meets uh, the customer needs. So, uh, and again, we have to consider more than just the price of the technology, right? It's the barriers to implementation, again, it needs to be a collaborative effort, and certainly forums like this are, are a good spot for vendors to understand those I'd like things. to build on what you guys all said, is that <clears throat> if you compare where we are today, compared to uh, late 90s, early 2000s, right? We've gone from an environment where m most of the, um, I would say, intellectual work, and a lot of the work was done within pharma. Right. So it was, really at the latter stages things going to CRO. So most of the work was being done in pharma. Also in an environment that a lot of the funding was pretty pretty loose for most co companies. Mm -hmm. So it was it was the concept of, you know, sometimes companies would bring a technology for the sake of just having the technology. Yeah. Well, that's right? the patents. And it's also right. if you look at the <laughs> regulatory requirements, yeah. the regulatory requirements you would mm -hmm. admit today, they're definitely more complicated, more requirements mm -hmm. compared to a decade or a couple decades ago, right? right? So those three factors today, I think the way we all, or the industry, uh, thinks about what type of a platform or technology introduce, when to introduce it, how much they want to invest in it versus, you know, what am I going to get out of it, right? It, it has changed. Um, so um, it's just, I think we're, in, we're, we are an interesting um, sector right now. As, as what will happen um, over the next next few years. Um, I think when you mentioned sensitivity, we keep talking about sensitivity. And for me, I just want to, you know, stay like an example you brought up the PK. For me, you know, I think the answer I was going to give was it depends, right? Mm -hmm. Because for one PK profile, it may dictate that you need the sensitivity and a wide dynamic range because your sample is going to be all over. For another technology, might be that you're actually getting a lot of the things at the lower part of the curve, so you just want to have a technology that shifts that curve mm -hmm. from, from right to left, so you get the samples in the middle of the sample, right? Mm -hmm. So is that assay mm -hmm. robustness, or is it sensitivity, right? So I think, I think there's so many factors, in that, and, 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 and as I'm just listening to everybody, every time I listen to an answer, I'm, I want to say, like, it depends. <laughs> That's what <laughs> thing that comes to, the, to mind. Right. So yeah, I think that the sensitivity requirement are really driven the, by the prog programs, for example. 
um, right now the, the formulation techniques, mm -hmm. they also improved. Not just the regular formulation, they have nanoparticles. Yes. You're not just measuring the total release, yeah. also the free release. Yes. So that they really need the sensitivity to see that in order to, for them to build up the, the model for during the in right. technology Exactly, and I can, I can, that's point well taken, but I can also, let's say, um, challenge saying that, okay, what if we don't go, let's say, to two full sensitivity, but now what if instead of a 20% CV on an LDA assay, to a 2% CV, which is, by the way, 2% is almost impossible with a lot of the technologies today. So it's a combination, and again, it goes back, in my opinion, depends on, you know, the, the project you're running, the type of assay, um, uh, you know, what, what, do you, what do you need to get out of this, 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 this assay? The requirements. I just want to come back to the, the software validation because when we evaluate new equipment, it doesn't matter what it is, it's that barrier of, oh my gosh, I might have six months of mm -hmm. software validation. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious, you know, so maybe some advice for sort of the vendors of these equipment is how much time are you actually spending in facilitating the, the, the validation? So I know, you know, certainly SIACs, you offer validation services. Mm -hmm. Um, but as you're introducing new platforms and you change a version, well, that normally means a, you know, a full validation, so to avoid that. But I'm kind of curious on the pharma side. Um, back when I was at pharma, it was very, software validation wasn't even a component. It is, do I have the budget? Do I have the people that can run it? Do I have the space to put it? And, oh, I'll probably have a project, I'll find one, um, to be able to run this new cool toy. Um, but what is it today? I mean, what are the barrier, the main barrier then for um, introduction of, an, of a new piece of equipment? Is it software validation or is it slightly t totally different? I think both. Um, I totally agree with the software validation. They took longer time in pharma as well. Um, but fortunately, we have the specific IT support so they can focus on that work for us. Uh, we, <laughs> yeah, we can kind of Unfortunately, to have this kind of support, uh, to we don't have to spend, uh, spend too much time on that so that's part. Not foremost in your mind when you're putting a capital request in. <laughs> okay. Well, I think um, although mm. we would like to uh, have the vendors to do the validation of the software, rather than for us to um, to to engage our ISIT people to do it, because mm. they have to first understand the software, right. and that could be a gap also. And so we, we typically looking for um, a instrumentation that actually have the validation, validated okay. the software as a part of the package. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's just not forget that even if the vendor provides a fully validated software, we have to pretty much do all that work under a regulated yeah. environment. Right. So regardless of if it is, um, well, it is like valid. In the cloud. It does help though, it does help. Yeah. But I can tell you at the same time, um, you know, Sykes is a different story because you have a well-established company that, you know, plans, I'm sure, way ahead of time, I don't want to speak for you guys, but way ahead that this eventually, this instrument is going to be used for this type of a studies, mm -hmm. and this is the type of validation we need. Remember now, we started talking about a lot of these exploratory biome, uh, ex I'm sorry, exploratory platform and instrumentation that we are now, as pharma and CRO and biotech, introducing for support of latter stage of drug development. Yeah, right. And these companies did mm -hmm. not put those instruments yeah. together with the idea that someday it's gonna be used <laughs> in that arena. Right. So it's a, it's a challenge, yeah. um, but it's one that, you know, if you need the sensitivity, if you need the robustness, if you need the improvement, you're gonna find a way to do it, right? right? Because you need to move the drug development forward. I'll even add the past two um, emerging technologies that we've brought on, we've actually spent about four to six months before we purchased the instrument working through software issues. Right. Because we just, we have a validation group that mm -hmm. is responsible for bringing instrumentation on. It's a standalone group. And the moment they, 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 they can always ask, can you do a demo of what the software mm -hmm. looks like? Yeah. And we do that and then afterwards it's like, okay, is this four months or six months in order to get yeah. this run? And we'll have monthly meetings with them, help them do some scripts, uh, you know, change the software so that it can become compliant and then we'll uh, pull the trigger on buying the instrument. Mm -hmm. And even that still is another endeavor to try and get it to all work, right? Mm -hmm. right. So it sounds quite complex. Arduous. <laughs> we've, we've covered things like cost, training, there's a regulatory piece, yeah. validation. 
One thing, obviously pharma doesn't have as much money as it, it used to have. I never heard return on investment come up yeah. from either the pharma industry or the CROs. Oh, no. CRO, that's, that's right. <laughs> but I'm, I'm interested because, yeah. you know, is there, I mean, mm. lots of questions, there's lots mm. of technology. So is mm. there a fear of backing the wrong pony? We just take it out of my paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I, I think that's a valid, valid yeah. question. Look, again, if you look at it, um, we, we definitely look at return on investment. Right. Okay, we're, we are a, and I, 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 I think maybe, um, I, my, my guess is that even if you do not calculate for return on investment, even a big pharma, you probably are looking, you know, you know, the return on investment is being looked at, not maybe from a financial perspective, yes. or maybe, you know, how much effort do I put in in order to actually move my drug forward, right? But for us as a CRO, um, we look at it and uh, look at it very carefully. We have done really well introducing certain platform just at the right time. What is the right time? It is when the, the, uh, the uh, platform was mature enough that we could bring it in, right. and there were enough clients out there that had done the discovery work and the pharma was ready, or the biopharma was now ready to outsource for latter stage of the drug development. So for that even, you need to be very careful. Is it one or two clients that they have only one or two drug on a pipeline that works, you know, can put on that platform, or is it becoming an industry standard? There is some guessing work goes on, some CROs, I would say, they're better at it in terms of timing when they enter uh, versus others. Uh, but it's, it's a challenge we face. There are beautiful, sexy new toys come out every day, and, and we ch we're challenged. As scientists, we want to jump on them. We want to go ahead and, and play with them, introduce them to our companies, but we also got to make sure that return on investment is met. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, probably uh, like before we also the study at a later stage so we already have some in-house experience we can share with the CRO yes. sometimes help with the tra SE transfer this type of work yes. but uh, right now the outsourcing happened pretty early yes. probably we never happened and never do that in-house so we didn't have any experience mm -hmm. you have to probably drive the, the new technology yeah that's kind of challenging for the CRO now but I would say, you know what, that really if we have had instances that, you know, we have formed a great partnership with the pharma or some of the maybe a medium-sized biotech, mm -hmm. and it was a platform that was absolutely needed in order to drive their project, right? And as long as you can go ahead and, and form that partnership that based on, you know, um, return on investment, future work, um, you know, if this is a returning client, um, you as a CRO, we invest in that and we make it, make it work. Um, and there are times that we had to actually say that, you know, this is not for us at this point. I'm happy to tell you, for example, some of the, some of the we were getting these, um, um, also the procurement, what we see in, the, in some of the companies, once they get that buzzword, it goes into the RFI. Yeah. Do you have this? Yeah. And if you don't, well, are you really up to date? And I'm glad to tell you that, at least for us, we hold our ground that we try to say, we bring a platform if we can know that we can generate quality data for you, not just now, but five years from now and 10 years from now on that platform. Okay, so we're gonna move to the third question. On one point on, on procurement, because I think it's quite useful, although I don't think we go into it deeply here is, I wonder whether the pharma industry and procurement push is so hard that actually the ability to take a punt on new technologies yeah. is being squeezed out of the sector as a, as a whole. But we've heard about the barriers, we've heard about the need, so really where are the opportunities? We've got all three um, classes here, mm -hmm. vendor, um, CRO, pharma, really where are the opportunities for new technologies and how do we help one another? Mm. Well, I think you'll find that, uh, again, back to the ROI equation, um, you're not really going to see a CRO being introducing disruptive technologies. Um, kind of nice buzzword, um, but it's not something that a vendor will come to us and say, hey, we've got this really cool thing, it's in the back room, we'd like you to evaluate it, and then introduce it, maybe the business will come. It's not going to happen. Uh, you're really back to Ashton's argument. It's, it's, it is about the... Um, the almost immediate need 
yes, we will project and we will work with a, with a partner to say, look, this seems to be something that you need and we'll go, go about introducing it. But the ROI part is never too far from our mind. Um, ROIs can be very quick. So, you know, you get some nice technology and it could be priced well, but the volume and things, those sort of things go into the equation. You may improve your efficiency. Maybe I don't need as many people in the lab to be able to um, push the efficiency through. So that all comes into it, right? But I don't really think that we're going to be the disruptive, disruptors in the, uh, in the new technology. Any thoughts? So there's some, um, I have been involved in some of the surveys I think some, the companies actually uh, talk to um, different areas of um, people who is doing different things and ask what's your needs if you wanted new technology, new uh, things, mm -hmm. what's the unmet need? So I think that survey probably will help the, the vendors actually decide how mm -hmm. to prioritize their um, the new the innovation of the new technology or introduction of a new platform mm -hmm. or something like that. I think that will help. Yeah, maybe I can build on uh, what you just stated. Um, <clears throat> to me, I'm going to go back with the, with the answer, it depends. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what I mean by that um, is that I think if, if there are vendors out there that they say, I can come up with a platform that make the existing platform instrumentation more robust, Mm. Right, robust, reproducible data, or can I go ahead and put the same instrument in, you know, five different you know continents and get the same results? Right, that might be one that is important for pharma A. Mm. Pharma B might be looking, hey, I'm going to be putting this new drug, you know, that I'm in the, in, the, in my pipeline, which is going to be super sensitive. I'm going to do a low dose. So guess what? For me, I want a platform that is going to, you know, low, low, low picogram per ml sensitivity. Right. So, so depending on, I think the company, the target, um, uh, the projects that people are working on, um, <clears throat> the requirements are, are different. That can vary from reproducibility to robustness to sensitivity. For, for, for me personally, for our company, we really look for platforms that are robust, get reproducible data. Most of the clinical trial that we support, they may last several years. Mm -hmm. And so for us, that reproducible data become extremely um, important. Yeah, I understand that the concern from the CRO, but the, from the pharma standpoint, um, we do sometimes have problem to outsource in projects because we couldn't find the CRO to do the work yeah. mm -hmm. because they don't have the technology. And they also hesitated to invest in that because they don't know how long this project will last mm -hmm. or how much the return yes. they can get. Yeah. So. I think probably mm -hmm. we should think ahead. They yes. may, they just, they project that today's several, tomorrow would be more because that's yeah. the technology moving forward. That's the direction. So they do have the risk, but we do have problem with all sorts of projects as well. For the yeah. CRO, it's a little chicken and egg scenario, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, so if someone comes to us and says, can you take on platform X or technology X, it's yes, but can you sign contract Y in order to do that? So, but then they'll look at you and say they don't have any experience on it. So it really becomes a little bit of a, again, chicken and the egg yeah. scenario because yeah. we, you know, we're willing to take on just about any platform for somebody so long as there's a contract behind it. But then it's in order to make the investment on your own. That's when it's a little bit more. Um, there's a lot of research. You know, we have we have a very process that's there and uh, get asked a lot of hard questions and. I think also as a scientist, you have to say, do I believe in it? You know, and you, you talked about the reproducibility and the quality of the data. It's, is it reliable and defendable? Those are the words we like to use. And, and is it something that I would even maybe spend my own money on? And that's right. sort of the approach I take. And you know, it's not, there's no easy scenario because we get asked all the time to take on all these big instruments and people sometimes get serious with us, but then they say, well, do you have any experience on the instrument? Well, it's like, well, no, but as <laughs> 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 complicated technology, yeah. need to train the people to work on yeah. that. That's another thing. Even well, when yeah. you want to also like complete the uh, the yeah. assay, you do the CRO needs the person who can do the work. Yeah, and that takes time to build the skills mm -hmm. and the technology to operate the instrument and generate the good data. I think, I think what you guys just stated is the concept we came, we discussed earlier, partnership, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it really depends. And, and I can tell you there are companies 
that the relationship with the CROs are very transactional. Mm. And then there are, and so there's no partnership, right? It's, do you have it or you don't, right? And, and, and if you didn't plan ahead, you can put yourself in a tough position. And there are companies that there is a true partnership, right? That, yeah, I know you're not gonna get your return on investment, but I'm gonna go find a way that we can work together. Um, so so, so it, it, is, it is a chicken and egg thing. It is a partnership thing, but I can tell you the one, the improvement I've seen, I would say in the past, since 2008, 2009, um, is that since there was in pharma in 2008, 2009 shakeup, and there was a lot of layoff of really good scientists mm -hmm. in the pharma, okay. what we saw was that at least from a CRON, we saw a lot of the really good scientists with deep scientific knowledge, right? Latter stage in their career, going to procurement role. And to me, in my opinion, now that I talk to a procurement person, I'm talking to a scientist. So they are thinking, it's not a transactional. I feel like the conversation is more scientific driven, timely driven, um, and more planning going on, mm -hmm. more partnerships. So it's, 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 I mean, I think as an industry as a whole, we're moving in the right direction in my mm -hmm. opinion. Now you touched on, Ashton, you touched on a point earlier about the longevity of a program. And so there's a sort of a question for Pharma here that um, the regulatory creep that you might introduce by bringing in new technology midstream on your pivotal trial. So it's one thing to start a trial and saying, well, okay, it meets the needs and okay, it's not perhaps the best shiny object to, to solve the problem, but do you really want to be introducing a new technology, a new platform that might be superior, but it might be midstream, particularly if you've got a three-year clinical trial for an immuno-oncology drug and it might just take that long. So there is that longevity that you're going to ask for a CRO to, to continue that project with the current platform that was introduced at the very beginning so as not to introduce uh, any doubt that perhaps the data that we now are generating is different from what you started with. So there is that aspect to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Roger, I would 90% I would agree with what you said. Okay. There is one um, maybe ca uh, caveat in that. Okay. If you look at the technology to me, the way I define it is that you have technologies that are now all of a sudden new, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the concept is new, the instrument is new, the detection system is new. It's just new for, from every aspect you look at it. And midstream introducing something like that, I would, <laughs> I would not That's put, put my thoughts on it. <laughs> and sort of pharma, they know that they don't put it. Yeah. Now, if you look at their platforms that they are built by just some automation oh. uh, introduction to a, to, a, to a colorometric, fluorometric, chemiluminescent readout, right? And we consider it a new platform, yeah. right? Yes. Even you want to call it new technology. So for me, if I'm talking to a client and all of a sudden I see that this, there's this technology available, it's really a continuation or a build up on an right. existing platform that is, we know it's working well, I will, I will be more lenient to work with a client to get that in to support their trial. Right. Okay. Yeah. From this point, uh, I think really uh, should thank for very thank for the for the vendor. They they build a um, more easy um, friend user friendly software right now. Like the sixty six hundred uh, instrument, it's kind of just uh, very similar to the MRM. You very easy to use to operate. I think that's kind of trend for the scientists to move on to the new technology. Because they are willing to adapt that. Yeah, that's well, let's really say that I've introduced a method. I've started it off in a triple quadrupole, okay? And it's meeting all the needs for a moment, but it's not quite as sensitive as I would like. So along comes Sykes and introduced this high-res uh, instrument. What is the comfort level for me revalidating the assay and now starting um, with a new t uh, platform, let's say high-res, with a much improved selectivity? Well, what if I'm going to find something I didn't want to see? Okay, maybe there was something co-alluding that wasn't there. I mean, okay, so we should have figured out selectivity by now, but is, that, is there going to be a willingness on farmer's point to put a potentially a multi-billion dollar asset at risk midstream um, and to introduce this potentially much more efficient, much more selective, maybe even more sensitive uh, instrument into, that, uh, into the mix? That would have to be data driven. It has yeah. to be really a need. Yeah. Yeah. You I mean, cannot just yeah. introduce in the middle of the pivotal yeah. trial just because there's something better. Yeah. It has to be a need for that yeah. better output. Otherwise, um, probably the risk are just too high.
the they high need to res, do. Yeah, the high res mass spec is probably one of the technologies that's the closest to coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so I guess the question there is how does that really get over that that right. barrier? Because right. if all the if all the heavy lifting is on CRO sector late phase, right. it's a hard sell. Sure. Yeah, and if I could just bring it back to opportunities, uh, Scott. You know, the opportunities are wherever a customer has a problem, right? Yeah. Or there's a roadblock. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it would be a mistake to try and prescribe or try to predict where those could be because it could be addressed with a piece of software that delivers ease of use, mm -hmm. something that delivers robustness. You know, it could be a little thing that makes someone's day yeah. a, a lot easier. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And, and, you know, the point that was brought up, by the way, that, you know, we don't want to change sometime. Um, a platform midstream, I get it, pros and cons were discussed, but let's not forget we're actually the farmers and CROs. Right now, we put billion dollar projects and the entire companies sort of online by having no choice than using a single vendor provided platform, right? right. So I want to make sure that we understand yeah, that yeah. we're talking about not changing a platform, sure, yeah. but look how many projects we all have on a PK, sure. on an ADA, on, on all these that is on a, based on a single vendor provider, and so platform. The, yeah. sorry, the biomarker space, if you're doing a trial over several years, right. the bridging of materials is very, very yeah, it's yeah. just, yeah. It's, a, it's problematic, yeah. and right. I'm sitting here thinking, there are, time, there are a few projects I wish I could have switched platforms mm -hmm. because there was so much change from one yep. lot of material to the next. Just, you know, this was for inclusion exclusion yeah. criteria yeah. and it was, it really caused a and, lot of problems. And let's not forget, I mean, At, we have had in the past 20 years, we have had, ex we have had uh, uh, examples of that. Yep. Remember the number of projects that were on the BioVerus yeah. instrument yeah. that when it was purchased by Roche that Everybody had to switch. The mm -hmm. disruption to the to the to the to drug development was pretty 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 bad, right? So, but yet, all of us are still going with some of the technologies that are provided by single vendors. So there's right. a level. It goes back to return on investment that we're also talking, and sometimes you have no choice and you take the risk. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's even like mass cytometry coming out now. I don't know if anyone's oh. familiar with that. This is. This is something I hope I can see in my lifetime in a CRO, but right now those instruments are over a million dollars a piece and good luck finding someone that actually, you need a Stanford postdoc or something right. to kind of get them to run it for you. You're going to live to be 100, so we're going to go in and see right, that in your lifetime. I hope so, but that, that's, you know, that, that's a wish list, right? You know, and now we're bridging our LCMS with our cytometry and that's, a, that's really a, an attractive thing, right? That's, yeah. Some, I don't know if you haven't seen it, it's great technology. No, so, so cost and that, so very expensive technologies, yes. there's a very prohibitive. Um, and, and then I think the expertise the piece yeah. is the other, even in that setting, you could make the million dollar investment, but what you're, how are you going to run, no one knows how to use that instrument. You know, there's only like two or three of them in the country at this stage, so I don't know how you're going to, even if you wanted to, I don't know how you'd be able to yeah. kind of uh, support that, at least mm. from a CRO perspective. So I'd wondered if we just go around um, the table and just say what's the one thing you'd like to see um, overcome um, in terms of new technologies? I'll start with you, Roger. Yeah, so I keep harping around the software validation. So I have this dream. The vendor will actually um, do all the software validation, but they'll put it up in the cloud. Okay, and so then I don't, and then the FDA or, who, or the regulatory agencies will actually say that's perfectly fine, it is validated. You're going to use it the way the vendor intended and the way they actually validated it. So now I can actually have my platform of choice. Um, I can chase the shiny object. I don't have to worry about all of that software validation because seriously that activation barrier of having to bring in new technology and prove in my environment that it works as intended, that's a huge barrier. So I think if you can find some creative way, whether to host it, if a vendor's hosting the application, um, we select the vendor based on the features and the way that we would like to use it. You validate it the way that we would like to use it, and off we go. That would be my, my dream. So for me, I think my, um, what I, my wish is very specific, and this is for immunogenicity testing, a, a technology that will solve the drug tolerance issues. Oh, that's and called mass spec. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's as simple as that, yeah. or as complicated sure. as the system sure. is. Right. Yeah, you, you know, for me, the way I look at point. it is, right now, um, at least in a large molecule biotherapeutic, about 
60% of the drugs being developed in North America, about 30% in Europe, the other 10% is in, in, is in Asia, and, and that number is going to grow. Um, I, I believe over the next probably decade or so, uh, due to the power of internet and a lot of people having the mobility to move to different universities, different countries, going back to their home countries eventually, you are going to spread the drug development, the biotechnology throughout the world. Mm. So, so for me personally, what I like to see is that the vendors come up with the, and I'm not talking about a new platform, but building on an existing platform that they have to make them more robust so you can have the same, and affordable, so you can have these instrumentations, the same instrument, that doesn't matter if it's plugged in my laboratory in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, or is it in Hamburg, Germany, or is it in somewhere in the Middle East or in Asia, mm -hmm. that, that you can go ahead and actually get the same reproducible data. So to me, to me that is, that is and, and I don't think you can look at too many platforms today in the drug development and say that is actually achievable or it's, 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 it's done. So truly more like a plug and play. Plug and play and affordability so it can be used around the world, okay. exactly. Great. And then the reagent availability to go <laughs> along with it, right? <laughs> Which is, that's a whole new 30 minute discussion. Right. Yeah. 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 Maybe, maybe next year. Yeah. 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 Would you like What's to your favorite? Uh, it depends. Is that <laughs> <laughs> no. So being a, a passionist flow cytometry, I think that's still something that we, we didn't really touch on too much. It's not really a new technology, but it's certainly something that um, not a lot of expertise, not a lot of, there's no white papers out there, so I think I'd like to see that platform in particular or any, maybe even more of the sort of cell-based methods with a little bit mm -hmm. more, um, you know, sort of regulatory, um, you know, guidance on how to validate that. Because they, they say the flow cytometer is not a GLP validatable instrument, right. and it's going to need to be. I mean, we're, you know, there's maybe one publication out there, but that's right. not the best, but there's no real guidance and I won't even talk about Ellie spot methods because there's absolutely no regulation on those, but like, except for some uh, really 1998 thing that mentions it. So I think my wish list would be to have more on some of the existing platforms. And mm. of course, you mentioned mm. software, so I didn't right. want to. Sure. Yeah. So my wish list um, probably is still f um, for the vendor. Um, I hope someday we can use the software very easy, like we use the. Uh, um, PC before, right now use the Apple, use the iPhone, use iWash. You just need to click, then you generate the data. <laughs> <laughs> then, then forget about job security. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Limbs on your phone, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, certainly speaking as a vendor, you know, still like to deliver, you know, that raw sensitivity, LLQ demands, that, you know, that are required in this, uh, changing industry, you know, uh, speaking about pharma, it's always uh, advancing. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, we've heard, and this has been a great panel discussion, that it's always more, uh, about more than just that, right? Mm -hmm. It's delivering reproducibility, it's delivering lower ba barriers to, to validation. It could mm -hmm. be speed of processing, ease of processing. We haven't talked about data handling, how to share, how to store, right. make, that, make that easier, so. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, I think we've covered quite a lot. Um, I think that'll make great viewing for the um, audience. And um, once again, thank you, for, um, thank you for joining us tonight and thank you for the lively debate. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.